All right. Well, my name is Patty Donald, and I'm currently the president of the Victorian Preservation Center of Oakland. Um, I retired about four years ago uh, from the city of Berkeley. I ran the Shorebird Park Nature Center and the Adventure Playground for 38 oh. years. Wow. So if you've ever taken a kid down there and played with wood, I probably handled the wood or the kid at one time. So. I think you've given me many nails and hammers. Oh, wonderful. Lovely. Yes, it was a, a great job and it works right into what I'm doing now. Um, my uh, grandfather was born in this house uh, and <clears throat> I'm going to tell you the story about how it came about and what our challenges have been and what we've, what we've tried to do about it. And the more people that know about it and understand it and appreciate it, uh, the better. Uh, we are one of the five historic houses in Oakland. Uh, do you know what the other ones are? The other five houses, the five historic houses in Oakland, do you know what they are? There's Dunsmere. one on Lake Merritt. Dunsmere. Yeah. Dunsmere. Dunsmere is one, Hellman Dunsmere. What's the one on Lake Merritt? The no. Somebody Camden. went to college, maybe university. Cameron Stanford. Stanford, yeah. Okay. And then uh, the mayor used to be mayor or mayor of Oakland. Um, Pardee, Pardee Dam. Pardee, right. okay. mm -hmm. And then the very first uh, group after the Ohlone's that had the property was gifted to Peralta. So the Peralta Hacienda and then the Cohen Bray House. So there's five of them. And those, the, what they all have in common is they came with money or a trust or they're owned by the city. We don't, we, we aren't. aren't. So it's a little bit different that way. So I'll go ahead and get, get started here. And I'm gonna set my timer, if it will let me, uh, for about 18 minutes. And then I'll give myself a two minute if I go over. Now, I encourage you to move forward on your screen because I'm going to have a lot of maps. And when you hold them up in front of a group, you can kind of see squares and stuff. But on your screen, you can really see stuff. So I encourage you to get up close with the maps because I really, that's one of my favorite, favorite parts of this. Okay, let's go. I hope. Okay. So... The Cohen Bray House is called the Cohen Bray House because it was lived in by the Cohen family and it was built on Oak Tree Farm by the Bray family. So Emma was a Bray and Alfred was a Cohen and they had four children of which this person right here is my grandfather. Wow. And this person is Emilita. And she lived in the house for 90 years. She said, I grew up in the country and I ended up in the city and I never moved anywhere. Or right. my arrow keys aren't, there we go, it's just slow. Okay, so to the, the people make the house, but the land makes the house. So if you look up here, you can see the Kakina Straits up in here, you can see Huchin. These were the first people who lived in this land since the beginning of time, if you go with what they say. And right there is where the property is. The next group of people, Spanish missionaries, had it from 1770 to 1833, right in this area here. And I love, this is my favorite map, and I've had it for years, and I used it at work. And it's kind of hard because the whole bay is kind of smooshed into this square. But if you get the idea, here's the Golden Gate is here to the left. And then you can see uh, Yerba Buena Island here. So the bridge is eventually going to go through here. You can see up through the Carquina Straits and up into the Delta. And you can see where the Sacramento River goes up towards Sacramento to the left and the San Joaquin goes to the right, and here is Mount Diablo, and wow. you can see the earthquakes that have shaped this land, and the earthquakes still are shaking this land. So it, when this map was done, San Francisco was quite a bustling town, and uh, 
all the people that were there obviously were there because of the gold rush initially and filled it all in uh, with people and became a busy, busy place. So in order for people to get anywhere, my great grandparents figured out that they all needed transportation. They needed transportation for themselves to get from one point of land to another, and they needed transportation for, for goods to feed them and care for them. So the next, that is where we're going to go next. They ended up going there and you can see it's just a peninsula at this point. It is not an island. Alameda is not an island. So we're gonna zoom over the top of that. Something looks a little bit more familiar to you. Uh, and you can see right here, the W.A. Bray house is right here. And so Fruitvale runs behind it and the Cohen house is here. And this is obviously after they dredged this channel. This is uh, San Antonio Creek. And that happened during the time my uh, great grandparents owned the property next to it. And you can see beautiful Lake Merritt and I'm sure your lamppost is down there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting, sorry. Okay, so if you go back in time, you can see where before it was dredged. And this is San Antonio Creek, kind of where the red is here. And you can see that A.A. A. Cohen owned quite a lot of property in here. And if you head up here, this is W.A. Bray. So he had about 106 acres. W.A. Bray had about 200 acres in the Fernside area at this time. So. Cohen, Cohen's family owned slaves in Jamaica on a coffee plantation in the 1600s. And they emancipated the slaves, sorry, 17, late 1700s, emancipated the slaves. They lost their income. And when A.A. A. Cohen was about 17 years old, he was given 50 bucks and said, go up to Alaska, they're having a gold rush up there, check it out. And so he went up to Alaska, nothing panned out there. He ended up coming down to Marysville and then San Francisco and with his 50 bucks, figured out a way to make it rich. Hmm. He created the, these ferry systems that would go from San Francisco to Oakland on the ferry and then from Oakland, and you can see the ferry down here in the corner, then from Oakland, you could take his train down to Niles or where the Warm Springs Hotel was. And he had a private resort down there that people could come and visit. So he was smart enough to take over these two failing railroad companies and make them very profitable between 1863 and 1869. And then just prior to the Transcontinental Railroad coming to the East Coast, he sold it to them. And so he made quite a bundle and they created a monopoly. So you can see these beautiful trains. I always think of Wild Wild West. A.A. Cohen actually had his own rail car that was like an RV and he could hook it up in behind any engine. And he traveled to New York City and he would go into Tiffany's and all these high-end stores and buy amazing items for the house you're going to see. Now, actually the, tra the trains did go to AA's rail station two months before the Oakland one was ready. It's interesting, I normally can uh, hit my button keys and go to the next slide. But, oh, at that, that time it worked. Okay, so A. a. Cohen had a small, he, he had, as you can see, 106 acres, and he had a very small house that he built initially. And when he got this windfall, he built this lovely large Italianate mansion uh, that had um, this huge, actually, indoor elevator. And with all these big bolstery boys and kids in the house, Emma, my great grandmother, looked at it and said, oh, no, we can't have this huge elevator here. They're going to push each other down the shaft. They're all going to die. So they all got big walk-in closets instead. So it all looks grand and lovely here. However, what happened, 
the very youngest daughter, which wasn't portrayed in that first picture, was just about to get married. And they were doing all these renovations to the house. So they'd moved quite a lot of the furniture out. But somehow or other, a fire started in the top of this house. And in 1897, it burned to the ground. Now, I say they pulled a lot of the furniture out. As you can see on the top right picture, that's the summer house and the bowling alley. They had a full dairy. They had a full orchard. They had a, you know, you could, they, this was the gentleman farmers. They made it rich during the gold rush and they moved to the country and they created these lovely farms that they could play on. And, but they also um, provided food for all of their relatives, which lived nearby. So one of the reasons why the house burned was because Emily Cohen uh, didn't trust the city of Oakland. Uh, through eminent domain, they cut right through the center of their property to make Alameda into an island. So you can see them working on it here. The top one, it isn't full of water yet, but this is the old Sozzle Creek coming down this way. And then this is the Sozzle Creek in 1905. Now, E.A. Cohen was a black and white photographer right around the time, just before Ansel Adams came out. And he has some amazing historical pictures of the Bay Area and San Francisco and the, and the earthquake and all of those. And uh, Pat Hathaway has his collection, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'd be showing a lot more of those pictures. Okay, back to that picture I showed you initially. Here is where they dredged right through San Antonio Creek here. So here's Cohen's property, and those pictures were taken right at that intersection there. Now, because A.A. Cohen had his own rail car and his own rail station, he had his own station that he personally could get on his train right on the corner of his property, which uh, pissed off the big four by no end. He had major battles with them. He actually didn't originally work for them. He uh, was in many, many lawsuits and battles against them, and he kept beating them. And so they hired him. <laughs> if you follow Sozzle Creek up to where the red squares are, this is all Bray property. And the house that we're going to see is right on the back side of Sozzle Creek here. So it's going to be this property right in here that you're going to see in a second. Right. Okay, so here's Sozzle Creek running up here, and here's Foothill, and this is International here. And uh, Fruitvale Avenue is running right up and down this way. So he bought these 200 acres and from the Peralta family and uh, created his homestead right in the middle. Uh, Howard Street was renamed 29th Avenue. Julia Street was renamed 28th Avenue. And International changed its name. It was Adams. It was, I can't remember the one it was before International. East 14th. I think that's what it was. Yeah. So if you look a little closer, this is where the homestead was. And this is where the Cohen Bray House is today. Watson Augustus Bray and his brother uh, transported food and commodities. And some of the food he transported actually came themselves. They had a cattle drive from New Jersey to California and then sold the cattle to the gold miners and made a bundle. Smart guys. Uh, and then they owned a mercantile business and they used scow schooners. Come on. There we go. Scow schooners like the Alma, if you're familiar with historic ships, to take wheat and grains from agriculture. The scow schooners could go way up and they have a, a center board that lifts up so you can get into the mud flats around the uh, agricultural area. And then they could load up all the hay and straw and then they bring it down to San Francisco to fuel the horses because that was the that was the transportation at the time. So it was quite a, quite a good lucrative business there. A family friend, and I don't know if you know the Coulter family, they actually are members of the Berkeley Rotary Club. So I, when I showed it to them, I put this in here. I thought maybe if you knew him. Um, and I'm going to talk more about Captain Cummings' ship. This is one of the largest ships in the area at this time. 
And uh, in we have documentation of, I mean, nobody's ever moved out of the house. So in every drawer, there's just magic things that show up. So one of them was this chart that Captain Cummings showed how long it took for them to get from England to California, 112 days. Um, he's got some wonderful stories and we have some great uh, a great docent who's researching uh, his history on, on the water, but he was a neighbor right on the corner of 29th and International. So let's look at what the neighborhood looked like. To be honest, it, used, it was originally like the Piedmont of Oakland before Piedmont was around. So a single house in a whole block was what it looked like. Wow. Huge street trees all around, wide open rolling lawns everywhere. All the houses around there were in tip top shape, beautiful drives, lots of glamour. So these pictures came illustrations from 1878. And if you paid $50, you could get a picture of your house in this atlas. So these were ones that were in the neighborhood that I thought were interesting. Derby lived across the street, at Derby Street, but Derby lived across the street and had a huge mansion over there, but I didn't put every mansion in this one. So Oak Tree Farm Estate, uh, Bray uh, lived there and had two different earthquakes in 18, uh, 68, there was another earthquake and they actually had to rebuild the second story. So it looks a little bit different than the one in the picture, but uh, earthquakes happen and these trees were everywhere. So remember these trees, because that's part of the story. Okay, so Watson Augustus uh, served on the board of mills. Emma Bray, my great grandmother graduated in 1876 and her sister in 1883. She got married or she got engaged to Alfred Henry Cohen in 1882. Uh, she had two sets of identical twins in her family, uh, but Mary died at the age of five. So Julia grew up without her twin, but this mm. is, okay. So here's the Bray residence. Here's all the, the orchard that was here. You can see the barns and sheds. And this was the asparagus patch. Mm. Here's Captain Cummings' house right there. And Weatherby is an important name. They are, were very good close friends and relatives of Emma and lived right on the other side of Sawzall Creek. Matter of fact, there was a lot of relatives that lived around there because he just sold his property to the family. You see this beautiful big garden. So the house was built in 1883. And they were married in 1885, but in, I'm sorry, 1884, but in 1885, somebody embezzled the funds from the Bray brothers. And in order to pay back the loans that he was given, they had to sell the 200 acres. And even the house, the Cohen Bray house was in contention, but because he had given it to his daughter, it's the only thing left of this estate. So Emma Bray was a socialite. Her parents moved into a house nearby, but what wasn't across the street. Uh, she went to New York. She went traveling to Europe. She had a grand old time. Alfred Henry uh, grew up in that rich family, but he was sent away to boarding school from the age of six all the way through high school. And then he spent six years in college. So even though he had that grand estate, he really didn't spend much time there. And he hated that he was in boarding school. So he homeschooled his kids all the way through high school because he wanted them around. But he was kind of a, you know, he was a rich man and he had a racing horses. He trotted, there was all sorts of racetracks nearby. He loved to hunt and fish, which you'll see when you get into the house. Well, as he got older, he died in 1925. He wanted to be an inventor. In the Victorian time, everybody wanted to invent. So he created this wireless radio called the Pulse and Arc. And it was used in 1917 for the Navy to listen to Germany. All the other um, radios were told they couldn't do it, but they used this one. So he was so excited about this. He had all these patents out on it. And then 
he had, there was a big explosion. It caught fire because it actually, I think there's gas or something in these vials and the whole thing caught fire. He got badly burned. It burned down the garage for like the third time. Um, and then because he didn't get the patent, he, he might've died a little bit from being depressed because he had greater plans than that. But they had four beautiful children. Oh gosh, I'm going over my time already. Oh, I had four beautiful children of which is my grandfather. Um, my Emma, as she got older, is sitting in the chair on the left. When my mother got married on her wedding day. Picture of my mother wearing the same dress uh, later. And I was wearing my mother's wedding dress in the picture on the right. And you can see my mother with Emmalita there on the right side of the picture. Okay, I'm gonna go a little longer. All this stuff happened. The family was given a choice. What do we do? Do we sell the house and distribute all the stuff in it? Well, Emily kind of started the process and got it on the National Register of Historic Places and became an Oakland landmark. So the family decided not to sell it. We decided to create a 501c3 so that we'd be able to get grants to be able to preserve the house. And so far, we're doing our best. So it's an East Lake bracketed stick house. So East Lake, and I'm not going to get into it too much, but as if you come see the house, you see these features of these cornices and these hard verticals and horizontal lines and protruding overhangs. Okay, so here's the house. We're going to see the, the first floor. I'm going to show you the first floor in this area here and a little bit of the kitchen. But if you come, on your tour, you'll be able to see the second floor. So the second floor, there's a master bedroom in the front, Emilita's bedroom there, they shared a bath. There were two bathrooms upstairs, no bathrooms downstairs. Uh, the girls had a room and then the servants quarters, the cook's room and the maid's room. And those are the rooms that I'm working on right now to get ready for a caretaker to come. But lo and behold, there's a whole nother third floor, a full attic. My grandfather, I think, might have slept in the tower, but I think actually probably in the right corner in that attic because there's something written on the wall that says bed for sale, inquire within, Douglas Prey Cohen. So I think he might have slept in that, in that area. But lots of storage and everything that broke got taken to the attic. So we have all sorts of wonderful old antique broken furniture up there. But right now we're gonna start and go through the front door and into the parlor the library, the dining room, and in the back areas. When you walk in through the front door, it was actually, this front door was a wedding present. It was a butt end log of a virgin redwood tree that was what they call curly redwood. And if you look here and see kind of the grains here on the paneling. Now in these days, nobody used redwood in their house. It was made for outhouses and chicken coops, but nobody thought about putting it inside. But it looks quite good, I have to say, and quite beautiful. So what you're seeing here is a family that never moved out. All the wedding presents from that original wedding are still in the same locations they were and nobody had any money <laughs> to do anything to the house, to do any great remodels or changes over time. The, the matriarch, uh, sorry, the, the man of the house died in 1925 and then there was a depression and the two ladies there didn't have jobs. So they kind of held on and did what they could with the money they had. And also being able to be a recipient of when other, all the other houses started to be dismantled and taken away, a lot of the furnishings came to the Cohen house. So if you see this beautiful piece here is reflected in the mirror here. And this mirror that you see here was an overmantle mirror. This is a fireplace, an overmantle mirror in the Fernside house. So you can see these little pieces here. So this is a 12 foot ceiling. This was an 18 foot ceiling. And the details are really quite amazing. He sold wheat 
and feed in grain. So of course you'd have a frame made out of wheat. The, oops, sorry, the dining room. Oh, we want to go back. Okay, the dining room, which hopefully you'll come see, and the library. Cameron Stanford House copied the carpets because they pretty much gutted Cameron Stanford when the city owned it. So they didn't have any historical references. So that's what we are, a study center for museums or people who want to know a three-dimensional house that hasn't ever been changed. Okay, so a couple changes. 1896, they added a porch, they cut out a door, all those teenagers needed a breakfast room and not a formal dining room to eat in. And then after 1907, the earthquakes knocked these two chimneys down into these rooms. And so they bumped them out over to here. So you can see these rooms here were all moved out and opened up over here. So if you go into these rooms, you can see that they were done during craftsman style. This huge mirror here was one of the ballroom mirrors from the Fernside estate. Uh, it was made to look like a hunting lodge. It's very comfortable and warm and one of my favorite rooms in the house. Okay, I'm just teasing you with a little bit of the house. This is what we do with the stuff inside. We're trying to maintain it and show people what we've got and have them be part of what we're trying to do. So I hope you guys maybe want to have fun with us too. So education programs, the children that walk by say, okay, is your house haunted is the number one question. And we say, yes, it is haunted. But if you're a nice person, then the spirits will know that you're a nice person. And you will never be harmed. And they're okay with that. That's what you were worried about, right? Okay, don't worry about it. Okay. We have students coming from all over walking distance. We have five schools within walking distance of our house. That was the biggest problem at the Berkeley Marina. Transportation cost more than the field trip. Okay, so we had a collection of, Emily to collected all the newspapers and talking about civics and, and what kids have to learn in high school. It's kind of cool for them to think about a family going through it and living through history. Kids like to see themselves in the mirror and they love to go up into the attic and see all the things around. The key clubs come, service clubs come and get credit for graduating and make a big difference in our yards. We've had Rebuilding Together come and rip out all the ivy and help rebuild the back porch. And a group's called Restoration Works International also has helped us with painting and a lot of different projects. The big projects we completed were we did get a whole new roof, which helped us all sleep a lot better. I've learned how to work on wallpaper. Uh, we painted the back porch. And again, we painted the, the uh, front rails. So this is what I think was interesting on Instagram. This was the original kitchen. There was a water heater right here. The water heater went into the stove that we ended up covering, uncovering here. So we fixed the plaster that was falling down off the top. We took off the top. This is where the, the water heater was connected onto the stove. Each of these concentric circles, you would put a different size pot depending on what you were cooking in. And this was the hot box here that, was, that they used coal to heat it. There were, uh, eggshells, chicken bones, a whole bunch of hairpins, an old plastic toothbrush, all sorts of goodies shoved down in here. But you can see the pipes running around. So the water, cold water would come into the stove, it would get hot and hot water rises, and it would go up this pipe upstairs to all the bedrooms have their own sinks, and the two bathrooms were upstairs. So this heated the water for the whole house for showers, and it had a huge oven in the front, which we're taking off here uh, to also bake in. So this is what I've been doing lately. I've, I've just been sanding this all down. Um, we're getting ready for brand new linoleum floors. The whole place has been painted. It's bright and white and beautiful, and you'll be able to see it. I went through and the hardware had all been painted over. So this actually is that orange goo you put on it. And I scraped it all off. And then I found the book where they ordered these, door, these poles and latches for their cupboards. I still have to work on this one a bit more. 
So it's painted, it's looking beautiful, and it's going to get this floor right here. This is uh, called Himalaya. So if you come after the 16th of October, you'll see all the floors. So today I was in there pulling out all the tacks in here and nailing down all these, getting ready for this to be put in the butler's pantry back here and the hallway that goes along in here. This is the original pattern, which we were able to get copied and it's going to be in vinyl. So we're very excited to actually have it come down. It just wore off. And then they tacked over this red stuff on top of it. And it's just been an awful area to take people through, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there's still awful stuff going on in the house. Weather is not our friend. I want to just get a bunch of preservative and spray it on until we have a chance to get the money to paint it. But she's falling apart. Things are falling off. It's not safe. And we are doing our best to show people that we mean business and we're working very hard to make the house better. And we're very excited about where we're, where we're headed right now. But we do need membership to have that happen. Now, if the house falls down, it means all this stuff that they saved. I mean, imagine never moving out of your house and never emptying any of your closets or drawers. Well, that's what we have here. And this was a group of volunteers that came and sewed labels into their into all the clothes we have. So they're all on catalog it. All of the ceramics have been labeled and is on catalog it. So you can go online and see what we've got. Some beautiful pieces here. And the fabrics are just amazing. Uh, a catalog it is the place where you can catalog your, sorry, your own goods. Let me go back a bit. Catalog your own, good, own things. And it shows you where they are and different pictures and back in time and it's free and you can search around and take a look on it, but it's called Hub Catalog It App. Okay, yes, there is paranormal stuff going on here. Uh, we have special events. We just had a paranormal group come through. You can see somebody's whispering in my ear right here. I don't know how it happened. Uh, they're there, there's about 65 different spirits that we know that are in the house. And they're nice spirits because everybody that's there is cool. They have good times. They like to get dressed up and they buy things from our store. So the spirits like them and they can stay. We, this was a 12th night din where we, we raised money. We charged $150 a person. We had a seven course meal complete with wassail punch in the beginning and cigars and brandy and Christmas carols with a lit tree with candles. Wow. Okay. Well, this is the end. I'm getting there. Um, COVID's almost over. This is the Y uh, Young Adult Project group that came and did tours and worked with me for a while. We're hoping to encourage many people to come back and get dressed up over Christmas because we're going to be looking really good over Christmas. And you can help us you can become a member, you know, for a cup of coffee, you can really help us. Uh, connect us. If you know people that like this or want to have tours or like talks or like to work on wood or in the garden, um, we appreciate knowing about anybody because we can't do it ourselves and we need your help. So thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you all. And do you have any questions? Thank you. That was, I love the in-depth history. And I mean, the idea of like, you know, family keeping a home and never like really leaving. I think that's really exciting that there's so much stuff in the attic that still needs to be cold. Not in the attic. It's in every friggin' drawer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I should mention we are, um, my husband and I live in a Victorian. And so the fact that we got to have this presentation is like super exciting. You have like, there's the there, the bay windows, look at that. the original pocket doors, a little, a little peek into it. Um, but it's so cool to see it being restored. Um, I guess my question is kind of related to restoration. Like, how do you kind of approach that and to try to be kind of accurate, but still kind of display what life was like um, then, back then? Well, to be honest, the first you know, 30 years, I've been working on this house my whole life. We, we go and work on it, but first 30 years, it's just kind of maintaining it. You know, it's like cleaning up the garden, you know, cleaning out the gutters. And then 
if you know we got a leak we got a roof and it we were waiting to get you know, enough money to buy the best roof with all the right shingles and all that and it's like we're not going to find the money to do that we have to do something now and so it just you, if if your roof leaks you lose everything the walls the floors the all the original wallpaper all the original carpeting it all gets damaged so i was really glad we did that and then we basically just show people the pretty parts of the house for many years. And we recently started doing restoration because my second cousin, who has been the last relative so far, I don't know if my children will ever want to move into this place, but who knows? Uh, last relative died about in May. So he died in May. And so he was a machinist. And uh, I love him dearly, but he was kind of a grubby guy. And the house and the kitchen and the walls and everything he touched were grubby. And so we just needed to clean it up. And we thought, well, while we're cleaning it up, we might as well, you know, uncover this shelf that the stove was under. And, you know, it was really, really fun. Um, so that, that started it all. And then we actually called it's, um, lock and, uh, I can't remember it right. M Montague. And they actually still have fell stoves from Hayward. And our other stove is a spark stove and Howard Bray worked for Montague in the early 1900s and created his own business called Hammer and Bray. And so he built the other stove. So it was like, oh, okay, might as well talk about stoves. And then without having a caretaker, we're like, okay, well, how do we do this? So we invested some money and the spark stove has always worked, but it works really well now. But then I had people saying, but it's gas. You shouldn't be using gas. So I guess we need to get electric hot plate in there to have stoves over the generations from coal to gas to electricity and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is that, that the hallways were just disgusting. And we have a new board member and she said, why don't you just spend some money? And, and we did. And we put it out there and it, you know, people ended up giving us a little bit more so that we can get better quality things. Our Hank Dunlap is um, our historian who used to be the textile professor at the College of Arts and Crafts. And he has really taught us what a treasure we had. And he went out and found a Fisher and company who actually took the pattern and was able to replicate it. And nobody in the Bay Area has heard of anybody replicating historic patterns. But if you see their stuff, they do uh, vinyl rugs and they'd be great for your house because you can get period rugs that are very durable and they're waterproof and um, they're rugs. So you can roll them up and get them out of the way. Mm -hmm. I know that in three years, they're actually gonna be making wall-to-wall -wall floors and that's what they're giving to us as a sample, the guy said he felt so guilty going in and covering all these amazing linoleum floors that he saw that he doesn't normally sell anything to a personal house. He sells it to manufacturers and big businesses, and then they sell his product. But he directly worked with us to, to do this. So I'm so glad. And it, we are the Victorian Preservation Center of Oakland. So if people are trying to do restoration in a house, it only makes sense that they could go to a house and see how it's being done. Mm. And if we could provide workshops in the back for people to reupholster their furniture or, or figure out how to sand it or what varnishes they ought to use. And so that people who have been collecting things over the years could go and find a resource to help them make them better to last longer. You are the guardians of your treasures and you have things that you know in your house that nobody else knows about, whether it's a photograph of somebody in it or a chair that you got that's very special or a spoon, you need to write down what that stuff is and attach it to that item so that that history that you have continues into the future. Mm. I wish somebody had done a lot more of it in this house. We get to make <laughs> up a lot of stuff. <laughs> Who knows? Any other questions from the crew? I know we have a lot of history stuff, so. 
feel free. Look forward to the tour. <laughs> true. Amen. I've been yeah. talking a lot. Thank you for letting me go a little longer. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, no I'm, I love it. Any, do you have a question, Dan? No, it was super interesting. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good, good. Good. It's a huge acre. Uh, we have about a quarter acre in the back. So what we actually developed a children's garden program and we have stumps the kids can sit on and we have raised beds and the kindergarten through third graders come down, we'll do a garden program. So we'll rotate kids inside for a tour and outside in the garden. Um, but we also want to be a community garden and we would like to be able to uh, have resources that the community can come to. So if we're doing workshops, we want to have scholarships so that within a five block radius, people from that neighborhood could come and learn these skills, these crafts that are being lost and gain something to make a livelihood with. So we're trying to think outside the box. We're trying to really incorporate the community. And I'm working with a group called the Artistic License Group. And they are all of these you know, people who do stained glass for a living and people who restore cabinets for a living, all historical uh, restoration. And they're coming and giving me guidelines and they've given me some freebies. I got a lot of free paint from them but of what our priorities are and where we should go from there. And they also are very interested in helping us teach some of these workshops. So I'm really looking forward to the future. Yay. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I guess this might be a hard question to answer on the last question. Uh, what has been the most, I guess, maybe interesting or surprising thing that you uncovered? Well, the thing that I didn't expect to find was we were cleaning out Ken's room and there was a clock in there. And I opened up the clock and I moved it to the side and I opened it and inside was a pile of looked like junk, uh, junk jewelry. And I pulled it out, looked at it and Emma Bray's wedding ring was in there. Wow. I was like, oh my God, it was engraved, you know? So I know it was her wedding ring. And I guess Emma, Emmalita hit these things in weird places around the house because she thought people might steal them but I found one <laughs> it was like a reward okay we, we just painted the kitchen and then I found a ring what's gonna what am I gonna find next if I repair something else so we'll see thank you so much Patricia for taking the time to speak with us tonight I you know I'm really glad we connected over Instagram and just this is such a fun topic and it's about our history in Oakland um as a thanks for speaking to our club we are going to be donating some vaccines in your name. What kind of vaccines? Uh, next, polio vaccines. Um, I'm sure you might know because your husband's part of Rotary, but mm -hmm. we have a mission to end polio now. And it's only the virus, is, or yes, the virus is only endemic in Afghanistan and Pakistan at this point. Um, so your time, we are contributing these vaccines and thanks for your time with us. Thank you very much. Rotary!